one. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome each and every one of us to the AYS webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about scaling your business. Um, I want to thank everyone that has already joined. You're welcome. So on our screen right now, we can see the webinar agenda. So we're starting off at 10 and we're going to have our first speaker join us by 10, five minutes after 10, after which we'll have a Q&A session for 20 minutes after he has delivered his talk. And then we're going to have our second speaker give his talk at 11.05. And then we'll have another 20 minutes Q&A session then we'll have a little talk about what we do at that service, and then we'll close. So this event is meant to last for two hours, 30 minutes. So thank you to everyone that has joined in so far. My name is Godfrey Oji, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's event. So like I just said, we are going to use the first five minutes to just do this brief introduction, go through a couple of house rules, and then we'll welcome our first speaker by 10.05, after which we'll have a short Q&A session where we can ask our questions, where we can um, ask for clarifications for anything we didn't understand during this talk. And then we'll have our second speaker at 11.05, and then another Q&A session for 20 minutes. Then we'll talk about at service a little bit, and then we'll wrap up by 12.30. So a few house rules. Um, for people who'd want to ask questions, first, uh, okay, before I even get into asking of questions, I'd really advise that we all mute our mics so that we don't have any interference from our own background. So please, let's um, mute our mics so that we can only hear, um, so that we can only just hear the speaker and we don't have interference from other people in the background. So please, if your mic is not already muted, please try to mute your mic. You're free to turn on your videos if you wish to, but then please keep your mics muted at all times. Now, um, during the speaker session, please, I would advise each and everyone of us to listen attentively. If you have questions that you want to ask, you can simply just write them down or you can type them in the chat box in the comment in the Q&A session and then would we'll ensure that the speaker sees those questions and responds to them. So please, if you have questions, you can either write them down because sending them while the speaker is speaking might be a little bit distracting. So let's just um, try to write them down. And at the time for Q&A, we can only type the questions in the chat box. So very quickly, uh, we're going to introduce our first speaker who is already here. Uh, Mr. O.M. O.M. Akman. So Mr. O.M. operations at Ingressive Capital. Um, he's a startup coach and investor in early stage startups. He helps entrepreneurs gain the clarity they need to turn their ideas and passion into profitable businesses. He's um, the VP at, the VP for fund operations at Ingressive Capital, like I said, it's a venture capital, um, capital firm focused on funding the next generation of African innovators across sub-Saharan Africa. He has affiliations with reputable organizations like Startup Grind, XSXW Peach, Startup Bootcamp Africa, Africa Entrepreneurship Awards, Global Startup Ecosystem, Ingini, and the Tony Lumelu Foundation as well. So without um, further ado, I would like us to make welcome Mr. O.M. O.M. Akban, who is going to be our first speaker for today and is going to be talking to us about startup funding. So please, let's welcome Mr. O.M. Hi, hi everyone. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is, I think, my second time speaking on this. Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited. Even it's very early morning. Yeah. Uh, let me let me quickly just share my screen. Uh, initially, I wanted to talk without a slide, but then I said um, I thought that it would be better to convey what I wanted to say um, using slides. So give me a second. I need to share my screen. 
Yeah, please confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay. One second. Um, while I'm doing that, I hope everybody's doing fine. How is everybody? Um, I like I like any of my sessions to be very interactive. So please, 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 please. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have anything to say, do not hesitate to do not hesitate to let me know. Give me a second. I'm trying to maximize this. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so I was, I was, I'm supposed to talk about funding your business. And this slide is, is more, is going in depth into it. So I'm just going to skip a lot of slides, but if you have questions, please let me know. Um, the very first thing I'd like to tell you is um, cash is king, right? When you're running your business, when you're doing anything in life, yeah. And everybody says everything's about money. Well, cash is king, money in the hand, money on hand. Your liquidity is very, very important when you're running your business. Um, you can run your business um, out of thin air. Yes, you can have partnerships. Yes, you can. There are, there are creative ways around, you know, the subject money. But, you know, money at hand is very, very important. Your cash flow is a major factor for your long-term success. How you're making money, how you're managing expenses, how um, how you use money generally is very, very important for your long-term success. Um, so you cannot, you must always take the subject of money, especially cash flow, very, very important. Um, there are various ways of, of funding, right? But I'm going to jump this slide and come back to it later. Um, to be sure, I mean, to be very, very, very um not to be too pedantic, I like to talk about certain things before I go into the type of funding sources that exist. But I like to say a few things. And depending on what stage of your business, um, I always tell people that advice is also contextual. You should not take everything you hear and just implement it. It, it must fit the current stage you are in your life or in your business. Um, but one thing is very clear. People do not fund ideas that they don't find interesting, right? Uh, no matter how how connected you are well your connection could help um, no matter how well you think you spoke about your business if the listening party does not see it as interesting or does not see future in it then the person is not going to invest in you um and even if you have not started your business how you pitch your business that's why i tell entrepreneurs and founders that how knowing how to Pitch. Not everybody, you know, not everybody's eloquent, right? Not everybody knows how to, you know, stand on stage and and impress everybody. But knowing how to sell your business, knowing how to sell yourself, is very, very important in your journey as an entrepreneur and as a founder. You cannot take that. And the beauty about it is that it's learnable. You might not be the most eloquent person, but you can learn to sell yourself. You might be the shyest person in the world, but you can learn to sell yourself. At one point in my life, I used to stammer. I used to be very shy. I, I, I didn't like to talk in front of people, but here I, I am doing it. So it's very, very important that you learn some of these things. And lastly, not all available money is good money. What I've worked in philanthropic space, I've worked in, in, in the venture capital space. And I can tell you for a fact, if the money doesn't, not all money is good money. The type of investor you're, you're talking to or you're receiving the money from, sometimes, the money you even get sometimes is too much for you at that point in time. And I always tell people that money comes with responsibility, right? Um, everybody goes, uh, money is the biggest problem for the African entrepreneur. Fine, 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 fine. I agree. I understand your point of view. But money is just not the only problem you face. As an Af African entrepreneur, case in point, think about Gokada and, and, and um, all right, right? They had all the money in the world. One regulation with one signature of a pen, kill their business model at that time. So um, money is not everything. Not all money is, is good money. Um, who you're getting the money from is very important. Um, how much you're getting at that point in your journey as an entrepreneur is very important. 
because money comes with responsibility. Money comes with all sorts of things. Um, I remember when I was managing the Tony Lumen Entrepreneurship Program, we've had fa- founders fight after we find, fund their businesses. I mean, you hear all sorts of things. Um, my founder has refused once a share of, of, of the seed capital. And you're like, wow. But that's what money does, right? Um, so before you seek funding, you see that I'm, I'm, my, my slides, I'm going forward and backwards. Before you seek funding, ask yourself, do you actually need it? Because it's very, this is a very, very important question. Can you bootstrap? I'm going to explain what bootstrapping is later. Can you actually bootstrap? Do you need investments from people, from investors, from that your rich uncle? I know of somebody, although he's running a very profitable business right now, um, his first business crashed because his uncle was an investor. Now, what really happened? Uncle puts in so much money to the business. Uncle was very emotionally tied to the business. And then he was supposed to raise a seed round from other investors. And his uncle refused to dilute his shares. Now, when you you raise money over and over again, the initial investors get diluted. What's, hmm, how do I explain this? You have a big piece of a pie. Now, every time you cut out to give other people, your share tends to reduce over time, right? Now, the uncle didn't want to get diluted, and that effectively stops this guy from fundraising. Um, so ask yourself, why do I need this? What, what am I going to use it for? Do I just want to be in the press, X person raised X amount of money? Do I just want to go and put it in MMM? Because I know people that got seed capital, put it in MMM. MMM. Do I just want to jo- run to Canada? There are stories and stories, and I've heard some, and I've seen some of People that raised a chunk of money and relocated their families to Canada or an European country. Why do I need this money? Be sincere with yourself. Honestly, be very sincere. As a founder, you have to be very sincere with yourself. Decide which type of funding source is right for you. I'm going to talk about that um, in the next few minutes. Do you really need it at all? Do you really need to raise this money? Find out if you qualify and check the eligibility criteria. I hear people go, oh, I applied, I applied, you did not even call me back. Oh, I applied and I got the rejection. Have you checked the eligibility criteria? Are you applying for an agricultural program as an e-commerce founder? Yes, there might be intersectionalities, but what, what exactly is the investor looking for? Are you applying as an e-commerce company, but your company is a pure play um agriculture company right so do you qualify for this type of funding are you going to the bank for a loan but you don't have collateral or you don't have all the things that the banks would always request from you then you are wasting your time and you're wasting your other person's time make sure your documents are complete make sure you have your business plan and i tell people at your first things of I mean, as when you start running your business or when you have that idea, when you conceptualize that idea, it's important that you write your business plan yourself at that first time. Yes, later you can engage a professional to help you, you know, brush it up, do your financial projections because most people don't like to do financials, right? But at that initial stage, write your business plan. It's very important because that is a journey that helps you refine what you think your business is. It helps you document your vision for the business. And I tell everybody, as you write your business plan, you see your business morph you see your business change right in front of your eyes because the things you by the time you're doing your research and your customer list you're like say, oh this thing this is what i taught but in the real life this is what is happening so you find your business idea begin to morph and change into something very better and, and more refined so or at least have a business you do out your business move at Bruno canvas very very important I mean, I tell people the fastest way to write a business plan is to use a business model canvas, right? Um, it helps you, the key part of, of, what, of what your business should, should the, the answers that you need to answer, uh, that you need to answer tautology in your business, your business model canvas helps you do that, right? Understand different types of funding, which I'm going to go back. And lastly, what other added benefit does the investor bring to the table? So if you're going to a traditional VC, look beyond the money. Find out what other thing is this investor bringing to the table? Does he have connections in the fintech space? Do they have connections to top leaders? Do they have connections to people that you think will be beneficial to your journey? Very, very important. 
So what other added benefit is the person bringing? If I join, say, let's do free ad for them. If I'm applying to the Tony Illumina Foundation or Tony Illumina Entrepreneurship Program, um, what other, what benefits am I getting from the program? Ask yourself, it's not just money. It's about all the value add you get from engaging in that, that value. I mean, that, that funding source. So very, very important, ask yourself that question. Know your numbers. It's fully to try to apply for a grant or try to um, apply to a VC and you don't know your numbers. And they ask you, okay, tell me for the last three months, month on month, how uh, has your revenue been? Has your revenue growth been? And you're like, eh, um, I forgot to know. Let me call my co-founder if you have one. Right, at least know the fundamentals of your business. Very, very important. How much do you need, right? Um, you're applying and you're not specific on how much you need and what you want to use that money for. Then that's fully, you probably will not get the funding. Know your capacity for collateral if you're going to a bank. Um, understand what the funding source will cost you. Everything in life costs something. Like I said, not all money is good money. Everything costs something. Even that free grant that you think would cost you something, whether in time, whatever, everything costs you money. Not money, everything costs you something. Um, research your options and build a great team and quality relationships because um, as you're applying, you want, to, you want to tell the selection committee, if I should use that word, or whoever is going to be reviewing the application, that you have the capacity to build a great team um, you are a good, you know how to manage resources because the team is a big part of, a big part of your resources and all that. Very important. Um, so I'm going to go some steps back and talk about the types of funding sources that are available. Uh, many of you have heard the word bootstrapping. That's using money out of your pocket, right? Um, I'm going to be launching a podcast with a mentor of mine and we're calling it the Side Hustle Podcast. And why are we calling it the Side Hustle Podcast really? Um, we know that a lot of people have business ideas and oftentimes, especially in the Nigerian context, start running those their businesses while doing, while at work, you know, having one job. And basically, they are bootstrapping their business. So they're taking out of their monthly salary, out of the money, out of their, their different hustles, and they're putting it into that main hustle or that, that, that business they're trying to build. So bootstrapping, right? Using money out of your pocket. Second method of funding sources, um, FFF, the fam family, friends, and fools. Now, not fools in the sense that they're stupid, but people that, uh, that just trust you and believe that you would manage the resource very well. So, um, and most of the times, very early stage entrepreneurs and very early stage founders often do this. They go to their father and say, dad, I know you sent him to school to do X, but this is what I want to do because I believe in it. This is what we can eventually become as a company. This, are many, this, are, this is the impact that I would be able to create. Please give me 2 million naira, and that signs the check and gives you 2 million. Or you, you know, you know at, at that December, family gathering, you, you talk to everybody and say, oh, people, I have the next, uh, the next idea that will make us a lot of money. I'm building the next space stack, right? And everybody says, oh, next space stack, wow. And, and okay, well, how do we contribute to that dream? So family, friends, and fools, right? The third one is bank loans. I always tell people as an early stage founder, please avoid bank loans. Now, like I said earlier, advice is very contextual, right? Um, if you're, if you're, if you have, if you're, there are certain, types of businesses that you might require a bank loan even at the very early stage, right? You might require floats. You might require that um, you need a huge amount of money to help with your operations or to help with your business model or whatever the case may be. So bank loans is another option. Angel investors, very important part of the ecosystem. Now, these are people that hear your idea. First of all, they like to operate at that very early stage. They like to fund very early stage businesses, businesses that they find interesting. And so they, they really ask too much questions. 
they just listen to you, look at your drive, see that, oh, very amazing person, very knowledgeable in the industry. He's trying to build a business, um, has the potential to build a great team or is building a great team, sells the business very well. Okay, I'm going to give you money for X amount in equity. That's X amount in ownership, right? Um, so yeah, then the other type of funding source is from venture capitalist. Now, um, VCs, uh, there are many VCs in, in Nigeria, from aggressive capital to micro traction to ventures platform, there are so many. So you can see that there are a lot of funding sources, right? But I like to, I like to say that before you go to a VC or before you apply on their websites, it will be very good to do your due diligence. And it's the same thing with angel investors. Do your due diligence on these potential investors. Very, very important. Ask around, look at their portfolio companies, look for their founders. And, and, and we are in this age where it's easy to get, it's easier to get information. I mean, engage if you engage with these founders on social media, everybody is either talking on LinkedIn, talking on Twitter, even, even if the federal government have decided to silence everybody talking on Facebook, talking on WhatsApp. So you can actually reach out to these founders and talk to them and say, hey, I see that X venture capital firm invested in you. How was that experience like? How, I mean, what other value? Remember how I talked about value? What other value add did, they, did they bring to the table? Do your due diligence. How quick did they wire the funds? Did they wire it in tranches? You know, all those very, very important questions so that you don't get yourself into something that you will regret. Also understand from their websites, you see one of the problems I always have with, and this is a general comment, is people don't like to read. Have you read their eligibility criteria on their website? Have you read what they are looking for on their website? Or you're just applying for the sake of applying? It's very, very important. Now, on that venture capital companies, um, or firms, I put business, business incubators and accelerators. So nowadays we're seeing a lot of this, these institutions, let me use that word, fund businesses, right? And try to own, have early, early ownership in, in those businesses. So incubator and accelerators help you, you know, build out your idea into an MVP or into a, a business. And then sometimes even help you shop for investors and then help you raise money or even personally invest in you. So uh, that's an option. And then you can crowdfund. People are getting very creative with the way they fund their businesses. There are platforms that help with this, or that people that just do it, right? I, I'll give you a very interesting example. I mean, well, interesting because quite a number of people have tried to pull it off. Um, there is a company called, what's your name again? Quaba? Yeah. And Quaba basically does rent financing, right? And at the stage when they started, they, they ran out of money. You know what they did? They built a platform and called the Rent Crowdy and said, hey, hey public, invest your money here so that we can finance somebody's rent and an X amount, X in interest, X amount in interest in a few months. That's a creative way of crowdfunding. Or you go and talk to all your, you know, your, your alumni group in your secondary school or your university and say, hey guys, I have a great business. Well, this kind of feeds into FFF, right? Friends, family, but you can also crowdfund. I say, guys, I have a great business idea and I feel I'm, I'm going to be the next, I'm building the next Amazon. I don't like when people do always, I'm building the next, I'm building the next. Well, yeah, I'm building the next Amazon, right? And um, I need 20 million to build this business. Um, how many of you would like to invest in this business at the early stage? If you invest 5 billion naira today, the potential value of that investment could be 10x in the next six months or one year, right? That's crowdfunding, right? Raising a bit of the, the capital you need from a group of people. And then you can use, you can do grants and subsidies very important. I don't like the term free money, but these are literally free money. I mean, there are, there are many government programs that are out there. Um, one that was really abused was the agricultural one from NESA. Um, there are subsidies and, and that the government gives. Um, there, are, there are programs like the Tony Illumina Entrepreneurship Program. And there are many 
and and that's why I tell people do your research, go online, Google, find find information for yourself. Don't wait for information to fall into your lap. Very very important. Now, this these are the type of funding sources that I like to tell you about. There are many other ways to you know fund your businesses. There are factory, I mean factoring invoice. Um, yeah, yeah. There are many other creative ways that people have found to build their uh, to to run their businesses. But this is these are the ones I like to um, mention today. Um, before we go, or before I round up this session, I'd like to quickly talk about the things that would make you um, get that funding, make you pitch well. And some of these are really fundamental points. Um, part of this is, I mean, are some of the things we used to look at at the Tony Element Entrepreneurship Program. If you go to their website, you see it there. But um, these are very, very important because these are key pillars of your application that you must cover before an investor would find you interesting. Is it feasible? I mean, how unique, original, innovative is your idea? Would it be viable in this place? If today you walk up to me and say, man, I want to build a ride sharing, a bike sharing platform in Lagos. I'll look at you like, dude, I, didn't you see the news? Don't, don't you know what happened in the last few years, right? So is it feasible at all? Does it even make sense in that in that context, in that area? Is there a market opportunity, right? Are there people that are willing to pay for this product or service? Is there a large enough size of market to make this commercially viable, right? I tell people that you're building solutions for the market and not for yourself. One of the biggest mistakes founders make is they're always seeing their solutions from, from their lens. And then they fall in love with what their, with the idea of what they're trying to build and not with what the customer really needs. And that's a very, very big mistake because you then build a product that nobody is using or very few people are using and you cannot, and, uh, and then you cannot sustain your business. So is there a clear apparent market for this proposed solution? Do you have an understanding of the market, customers and competition? Have you done your market analysis? What are the trends? One of the questions I ask people when, when I, I, I speak to them on calls is, what are the market trends that you're seeing now that would positively influence your business or even negatively influence your business, right? You are building, you say you want to build a crypto platform. What are you hearing in terms of rumors from policymakers, the CBN and all, that makes you feel that this business will be successful? down the long run, because regulators have clamped down on blockchain. Convince us. Let us know that you have done your competition analysis. Don't tell me that no competition exists. For every business, even if you are the first to market, there is a competitor for your consumer's time, your consumer's money, right? So who is your competition? How are you planning to be number one in the market? And even if you cannot be number one in the market, how can you get a huge market share when you start your business, right? Financial understanding, let me quickly look at my time. Oh, just 30 minutes, wow. Financial understanding, do you know the, your, your numbers, your basic, you know, like I said, it would be crazy if you're pitching to someone and talk to someone about your business and they ask you the simple question, what was your revenue for last month? And you're like, I don't know. That would just be very, very, I don't know, that, that's a big disservice to you. Do you know your basic understanding of revenue streams? Do you know your business model? What are your cost drivers? What are your financing needs? What do you need money for? How are you going to use the money? And if you're talking to VCs, and depending on your stage, what is your valuation? Interestingly, in this in this slide, there's, there, there, there are things on valuation, but I, I don't think I'm equity and valuation, I don't want to get into that. Um, is your business scalable? People invest in interesting businesses. People in initial, okay, let me just be very clear. Most investors invest in businesses that they see and that they can get an ROI from, right? That they can get a return on investment. Some people want times 10, some people want times 100. And one of the ways to show that your business will bring huge returns is to show the potential to scale across different markets, to scale beyond your mom and pop shop in Ilupeju to Mushin to Oshodi, right? What is the potential of 
replicating this business across different regions. Bamboo is launching in Ghana in the next few weeks. Now that's scalability. Um, Kobo 360s in the various regions in West Africa, right? That's scalability. Um, Paystack launched in South Africa. Flutterwave is in quite a number of African countries. Scalability. How, what is the potential of your business? How can it, can it be replicated across different markets? Then your leadership and entrepreneurial skills. Interestingly, I was talking to somebody the other day and he was telling me, how can, how, why would you say that from an application form, you can tell if somebody has leadership skills? You can tell if somebody has entrepreneurial skills. But I say it's very, very important. It is in how you portray yourself. You can demonstrate your experience, your passion, and your commitment to building a certain business in your pitch. So all those questions like, how, how what, what, what has been the biggest, biggest challenge you faced in starting your business and how did you surmount it? From there, I can tell if you have grit, if you have, yes, I know everything can be very subjective, right? But I can tell if you have that grit, if you know how to manage resources. And that's why I say, understand what the people are looking for, the people behind the application form are looking for. Things like, oh, I manage, I was head of treasury, and this is very simple, simplistic answer. I was head of treasury in church. I managed over 3 million naira in monthly, um, monthly dues from church workers. And from that, we were able to build X and Y. Now that's actually demonstrating your ability, your, your integrity, your ability to manage um, capital in quotes, your ability to disburse resources. So these are things that you can actually show in your application form or when you are pitching to anybody. And then the last, the greatest growth, growth potential. And, and in, in a way, I tie this to some of the SDG objectives, like um, does your business have the capacity to actually create more jobs, direct and indirect for people? Does it have capacity to increase the earning power of people in their region? Does it have capacity to actually educate people and make them live? I mean, how, how does your, your business influence the welfare of the, the current market that you, you, are, you are existing in? I mean, this, this, this are, these are basic questions you have to ask, to ask yourself when you are planning to pitch or you're applying for that funding or that granting or your grant or you're talking to venture capital companies or you're talking to Indian investors. These are these are core pillars that you have to answer, a question you have to answer. Um, yeah. So I think that's that is that on funding. I like to take questions now, except you want me to talk a bit about a core part of, of funding, which, which, which is understanding equity. But I think that that's just going too, too far. Um, I'd like to take questions now. OK. Um, thank you so much, Wem. You still have um, some seven minutes. So if that's okay. going to be enough for to just give a little insight on equity, that, that would be great for the audience. OK. Um, let me just go to, OK. So let me, let me talk on the fundamentals of equity, just real quick. Now, I tried to explain to you what ownership in a business, how you have a big pie, and because you want somebody, your business is the pie, you own 100%, and you want somebody to invest in your business for a share of the ownership. So you take quarter of your business and give out to that person and say, own quarter of my business while I own the other you know, part of it, right? No, quarter, no, no. Anyways. So your ownership ends up reducing over time as you hand it off to people, right? 100% um, of nothing is better than, is, is actually, you know, 70% <laughs> of your business or giving out 30% of your business is still better than having 100% of nothing. I find out that a lot of founders, I and mean, it's okay to, be, to not trust people, it's fine, that's life. I'm not really trustworthy, you don't want to hand over ownership. But it's important for you to know that at various times of your life as a founder, you might have to cede ownership of your business, a small percentage. Now, I understand that there are also sharks in, in, in the ecosystem that are looking to get the most out of you. Um, 
So three weeks ago, I was talking to someone and he said, oh, this venture capital firm that me, I know, that I even respect, asked me for 40% of my business. And I was like, what? Please pick your slippers and run away, right? Nobody, and at this stage of, this stage of your business, at the very early stage, do not give anybody more than 15% of your business. I cap it at 15%. Anything more than that is shooting yourself in the foot down the line. So equity is basically ownership in your business. And these are four equity rules, right? Let me just quickly run through it. Treat, treat, treat equity like gold, like equity is very, very important. Don't shortchange yourself by saying, I don't want to give over equity, right? Because I want full ownership of my business. But also be careful not to give on the type of people and the amount of equity you are giving to people because it's like marriage. Once you get people into your business in terms of ownership, it's very hard to get them out, especially if they choose to be very stubborn. So unless your goal is to stay very small and grow organically, you should actually aim to have that, the value of your startup increase, right? By giving out small pieces of your business so that you can generate funding, right? Um, the pie is fixed, but the value is variable. 100% of something, that's what nothing is nothing, which is what I was trying to say at the beginning. But if you own 5% of a truly amazing startup, it could translate to million, millions of dollars. Now, I'm not saying give out 95% of your business at that very early stage. Like I said, try to cap it between 12 and 15%, right? Um, because there, as you raise money, there are implications on ownership of your business. The more you raise, the more, especially if you're raising true equity or safes like um, venture capital companies use um, simple agreement for future equity and sometimes convertible notes, um, which, are, which are kind of loans that convert into equity, um, you will lose ownership of your business. Your business, your, your ownership begins to dilute bit by bit. And so you find out that companies that have raised, you know, raise up to series B, C or series D, the founders own like 5% of their business, even if their ownership is worth a whole lot, but then they've lost control of their business over time. Um, know what, so I always tell people, when you're building your business, keep aside equity for your initial employees, your co-founders too, because at that point in time, you cannot pay for talent and the market is hot right now. COVID has shown people that we can all work remote. So you've seen talents are finding jobs from across the world. People are finding opportunities. I was talking to somebody yesterday and he said, man, for somebody that has never worked for anybody, my first job, they're going to pay me $5,000. And I was so excited for him because I know how much he, he put into, he was running a tech blog at that time. And now somebody called him up and he's going to be paid $5,000. This is somebody that's never had a job. Right, opportunities are beginning to open up for people across the world, right? So I know that at this very early stage, one of your biggest problems will be talent, recruiting and keeping talent. And one of the ways to keep them motivated and keep them in the company is by equity, giving them a small share of the business so that they have something to hold on to and say, okay, I'm working and I'm not being paid market rate because I know that in X number of years, this company has potential to be this. And then the value of my ownership will be this, right? Equity is a very, very good way to motivate your staff. But also know what motivates your staff. Because for some people, they might not just be equity. It might be money, right? It might be security. So know what motivates your staff and know that you might have to give out equity to your, your employees, right? And then last, um, but not the least, so I'm going to questions. Um, take equity decisions very, very serious. People take too long to discuss equity. Meanwhile, you should be discussing equity right at, at the beginning of your business. Don't just throw around percentages and say, you, I'm giving you 10%, I'm giving you 5%, I'm giving you 2%, because that 2% difference, that 2% can actually mean a lot. It could mean that your founders can actually kick you out of your business. So you have to be very careful in making equity decisions and I understand funding, equity can be intimidating topics when, when even for big, I mean, I was talking to a founder that is raising a series A and we're literally talking about equity and how he was getting diluted. And we're trying to project his dilution in the fund. And he told me that, oh, but look at you. It looks like I'm losing ownership of this business every time I raise money. Now this business is doing well, but his concern was that he was losing ownership because there were about three co-founders and so it meant that his co-founders and his board 
they could potentially remove him if things were not going right, the business was not doing well. I know we're just thinking about implications down the line. So these are topics that even seasoned, seasoned entrepreneurs run away from, but they are very, these are very, very, very important things that you have to know as you run your business because um, ignorance is not an excuse. Not, there are so many businesses that have, 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 have been, let me use the word destroyed because the founders did not take funding and equity conversations very important at the very beginning. I understand also that as founders, you just want to build your business. You're laser focused on, I just want to build business. I just want to create value for my customers. That all these other things do not concern you. But at that early stage, you have to know a lot of things. You have to know, you have to read things, you have to read blogs, sign up for or on, on tech about tech crunch, on all those tech blogs, on, on those blogs that talk about businesses and try to, even if you don't like to read books, read articles. I, personally, I'm not a big fan of, I mean, I don't, I, I, I suck at reading books at, at different times or sitting and finishing a book. In short, I have so many books where I read just quarter or half and I, when, when I get the thing all together, I drop the book. But if you read articles, I mean, there are, there are platforms that give out very rich articles every day, every week, you would, you would, you know, still get information. The important thing is to read and learn about what's happening in the ecosystem. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Thank you so, so much, Uwem. Thank you so much. Um, if this was a live session, if this was a physical event, this would be where we all stand up and give you a huge round of applause. Thank you so much for the detailed session. I think we already have two questions, which, uh, which is, uh, People are basically asking if they can get the slides after this. Um, yes, I could share you a version of this slide. I can't share everything. So okay. I, I would yeah, share a version of the slide. All right, thank you so much. And then we have two other questions aside that about slides. So the first question is, how do you know when to raise money as debt versus um, as equity funding? Is there a rule I mean, uh, for that? Is that necessarily a boot to that? Well, not really. Like I said, it all depends on you as a founder, right? And at that's on what stage of your business and what responsibility you're ready to bear. Now, if you raise debt funding, you know very well that you probably paying because of because the cost of capital in Nigeria is very high, you're going to be paying a very high interest rate, right? Yeah. And you know what happens when you raise money from certain people. Your life becomes hell if you cannot pay back. Imagine if you raise money from a lack of finance. They will send you to your door every month, right? So are you ready for that? Are you ready for that responsibility? But I've also had founders that said, I don't want to cede ownership of my business because with seeking for equity, you have to give out a bit of ownership for your business, equity funding. With loans, you know, they're mostly collateral backed or, or backed by something. And you oftentimes do not necessarily need to give, give out ownership of your business. So you see that you have to make, ask yourself first, are you ready to give up ownership of that your, of that your business? And um, what res, are you ready for the responsibilities that come from raising from those different funding sources? And yes, like I said, everything is contextual. So if it's just to, if, you, if you're in your su supply business and... Hi, Samuel, in, please could you meet? If you're in a supply, you. if you're in a business that you, you, you're supplying people, let's say you're into a health tech company and part of your, you, you deliver drugs to people, but you need to build up your inventory, right? And you need a huge sum of money to pay the manufacturers. Then you can, you can default to debt funding because it doesn't make sense to give out equity for something that is, I would say, temporary. If you can solve from debt funding and you can pay back immediately the supplies coming and you sell to your retailers or your wholesalers, right? So depending on what you want to use the money for, that can influence your decision. There is no hard and fast rule to that. That same um, example I just gave you of having to fund your, I mean, fund your supplies some people might end up raising a huge sum of money and saying, and say, I want to keep money in the bank to deal with that for the next one, two years, right? So it depends on where, what stage you are, what responsibilities you're ready to you carry to carry on. And um, yeah, 
So there's really no rule to that. Okay, Th thank you so much. I think that pretty much answers it. So we have another question that says, can you explain what series A, B, C, and D funding are? I hear of it a lot, but I don't know mm -hmm. what it is. Okay. Um, at various times in the lifespan of your business, you would need to raise money. At the very early stage, when you're turning your idea into an MVP or you're turning your MVP into a real business, right? Um, we call that the pre-seed seed stage. So that period where you need somebody to seed, see, you know how see the word seed, like you plant seed and it starts growing, right? You need somebody to plant, help you plant seeds or plant some seeds into your business so it can germinate into real business. So that pre-seed seed stage is when you're, you're, build, you're building out your MVP, you're, you're targeting your very first set of customers, you're, you're, you're building your customer base, you're also iterating, you're improving your products or services. Now, for, so for every time you raise, there's a name for that round. Now, if you've gone beyond your three seed seed stage and you now want to go to scaling mode, right? You've tested out your, your, your products in the market. People love it, people are willing to pay for it. You've built out your tech platform if it's tech. And um, you're now ready to scale. Because remember what I told you that investors invest for a reason. They want, oh, and I forgot to say something, and I'd like to say it now before I continue. Investors don't necessarily invest in the business. They invest in the people behind the business. Very, very important. Very, very important. I, I'll say this again. Yes, the people invest in ideas, but they always invest in the people behind the business because you can pivot a business. You can pivot a business model. We can't necessarily pivot the founder. You can't necessarily change him and his team or her and her team, right? So very, very important. So back to it so you're, you're now about to scale your business right you now go to your series a because you're not thinking massive expansion across nigeria across west africa you want to go to ghana you raise your series a now um so every every round you raise now is called a b c d e right um by the time you're in series d you probably have very little knowledge of your business you're probably think, thinking an acquisition for a big company or you're even thinking IPO, right? IPO is listed on the stock exchange, right? Yeah, so that's how, I mean, that's what in a, in a simplistic way, and I hope I'll be able to break it down to the most simplistic way. Every time you raise the round is called something from pre-seed to seed to series A, B, C, D. Okay, Th thank you so much for that explanation. So we have one more question and the person says, thank you so much Owen for, okay, sorry, good day. What are the factors that can affect the percentage of equity? I think the person is asking, what are some of the factors that they should consider before deciding what percentage of equity a co-founder or an investor deserves? Okay, um, like I said, from my experience, like I, and I've said that advice is very contextual. I would say, if you're talking to an investor, do not give anything more than 12 to 15%. Right, it could be less, but don't go above fifteen percent. For co-founders, that's definitely up to you to decide the value that they bring for to the business, the long-term plan for the business, and yeah. So it's up to you to figure out what value is this person bringing on as a co-founder. Can I actually pay him, or should I give him equity? What amount of equity is enough to motivate him? So you can decide to give out ten percent. Can can give a twenty percent. But if you have more than one co-founder, then you have to fall. You have to be very careful because you know that as you dilute, you're going to be losing a chunk of your business, a big share of your business. And you don't want to be at the stage where the co-founders can... So this is not... An, the co-founders can decide, three of them can come together and say, oh, we are going to vote on something. And because we don't like you, get out of the business. So three against one. So you have to be very careful at the, so you have to model these scenarios at the very early stage of your of your business and 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 be careful with, with it. So to answering your question, ask yourself if it's, if it's a co-founder, what value is it bringing to the business? Is it something I can pay for? If not, is it how much equity can I use to motivate him and her? her? Um, also explain to them that because equity is five percent doesn't mean that it won't amount to something. The company becomes very successful, right? So that would determine how much you give a co-founder. Uh, for an investor, please don't give more than 
I know there are people that ask for way more, but an investor that is asking for more than 15% does not have your best interest at heart. This is just my personal, personal thoughts on this. Because as you grow, as you dilute, as your ownership dilutes, you will lose a chunk of your business and your investor, <laughs> just don't give up more than 15% to any investor. Well, all right. Um, thank you so much for your responses, Owen. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if we still have more questions. We still have about 10 minutes for Q&A, so please um, ask your questions. If there are things that you need clarifications on, please, um, you can ask them as well. So, Owen, I, I have a question of mine, right? And it's around data. So. Most times when you're trying to do a feasibility study for businesses, mm -hmm. most times you don't have the exact data. You just find little bits and pieces from government reports, from maybe other businesses that have run um, similar, something similar to what you're trying to do. How do you justify some of that to maybe investors that are looking for very accurate or um, concise information when you can't find some of this? It's actually a very good business I mean, question rather, because um, getting data, especially on this side, part of the continent is really can be very difficult because we suck at documenting and keeping data. Yes, big companies do do a lot of fund, a lot of research like the KPNGs and the Deloitte and the consulting firms do a lot of research and then they are, they are, they are research data, their data costs a lot of money. However, it's not much about the numbers. It's about the story at the early stage. It's about the story you can extrapolate from the numbers, right? And okay. if you can correctly extrapolate the kind of story or the kind of data that would positively influence your business or show you that your business will succeed, it's about how you interpret it, interpret your data. Very, very important. So let me give an example. I'm trying to give an example. We have... Okay, a very good data. Are, your, 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 business is, your business is, you sell diapers. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're creating diapers. And, and they say there are 5,000, and this, this interpretation might not be correct though. So just, I'm just an example. In Lagos alone, there are 10 million nursing mothers, right? And in those 10 million nursing mothers, 8 million of them live on the mainland. Now your business produces diapers. And your business is going to be located on the mainland. So your assumption is that 8 million of those nursing mothers on the mainland is your market, right? Yes. However, if you drill deep, deep into that data, you start to ask, how many of them can afford the price points of your data, right? How many of them are married or are single nursing mothers? Because that will influence where, who, which part of that market you are going to target. Let me take it a step further. Who makes the buying decision for diapers? Mothers, right? Yes. Who makes the paying decision for diapers? Probably the husbands. So who should I target in terms of my diapers. Like I said, this is not necessarily the best example, but it's just to show you how you can extrapolate data. You can assume and say, okay, I'm going to be targeting more of the fathers because when I go to the fathers to advertise diapers, that father will be like, go and talk to the woman. The woman will be like, oh, I like this diaper. Honey, pay for it. Do you, do, you, do you see what I just did with the data? I'm not saying it's not necessarily correct, but this is how you can extrapolate insights from data. You might not have all the data in the world, but you can extrapolate something sensible from it that shows the investor that there is actually a market or there's potential for growth. Okay. Um, thank, thank you so much for, thank you so much for explaining that. So we have about six, seven more minutes. So I'll just run through three more questions that we have. So the first one says, can you give out equity for a specific period of time? Say you give an investor, say you give an investor or initial employees five percent for five years. Can that work? Mm -hmm. For five years, unfortunately, no. 
once you've given ownership to somebody, it now depends on what the person wants to do with the ownership. Does he want to sell it as secondary or in, in another round? Or does the person want to just stick on your cap table and be there as you grow the grow, right? Um, but what you can do to protect yourself, and I wish I, 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 I unfortunately I forgot to mention this earlier, is to vest your ownership. Now, this is for employees and co-founders. You can vest and say, um, Mr. X, I love the value you bring to my company. I, you're a co-founder, right? And I want you to own 15% of this business. However, I'm going to vest it over a period of time so that you cannot get this whole 15%, except you have worked for my company for X number of years. Usually people say five years, right? And so for every year you get X amount of the equity or the ownership till the fourth year or to the cliff period where you can now start earning a certain amount, right? So long and short, you can protect yourself against people or against people just taking ownership of your business and working away by investing it over a long period of time. Two years, three years, four years, five years. Now for investors, like I said earlier, taking on money, giving out equity is like marriage. It is very hard, divorce is very hard. You don't want to be in that situation with an investor. So don't give out equity when you're not ready for that struggle, right? Because to get your equity back or ownership or buy back your ownership can be very difficult. And now it's now the person telling you, the value of my equity is $5 million. If you can pay me $5 million, I'll give up my ownership. So it's, it's you just be careful the amount of equity you give out to an investor and you can protect yourself by investing when you're talking um, um, about co-founders. But you can't give people equity for a period of time. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so we have two more questions. So this, the first one is, can you shed a bit more light on bootstrap businesses? At what point is it okay to walk away if you have not raised funds, or I think if you're not also profitable? There are companies that are done extremely well by just bootstrapping. Hope you know that Microsoft was a bootstrap company till the very, very late days where they brought in an investor for a strategic reason. They wanted him to sit on their board because I think they were chasing, was it government contracts or something? I can't remember the story. They are big companies. MailChimp was one company that bootstrapped till they became very huge. They are companies that have bootstrapped till they became very, very, very big. Um, so yes, you can bootstrap your business. And like I said, not all money is good money. Sometimes you just have to wait for the right investor right investor that gives you way more than money, gives you the market entry contacts, gives you business development contacts. Because some investors are, because they are betting on your business, they do everything in their power possible to make you succeed. Because if you succeed, they actually succeed and they have high returns. So yeah, that's my answer for that question. Okay, but, but I, I think the person was asking at what mm -hmm. point do you walk away from the business if you haven't raised more money or if you are not profitable? Oh, are you, are you okay? So at what point? That's up to you. That's up to you, to be honest. That's why I said, I, I say this when everybody goes, you know, start your business, start your business. It is not easy. I mean, just managing people is not easy itself. Um, but if you have tried everything and the business is not working, say, for example, COVID happened, hand of God. Like you don't plan for these things. And then your business is dying. There's lockdown. Nobody's patronizing you. You can decide. You can just look at everything and say, in the next few months, it doesn't look like things are going to get better. My mental health is suffering. I'm not making money. Um, things are, uh, are not looking well. Let me pivot or close down this business. And it's okay. It's actually okay. It's fine. You're not a failure if you do that. So yeah, if you look at all the market trends, look at the macro, micro and macroeconomics, things and don't look like they're doing. They're going to do well over time. You're you're suffering mentally. Your staff are you're not able to pay your salary. The staff, the salary of your staff. Then I think it's time to walk away from that business. However, like I said, advice is contextual. You you can decide to hold on to that business and. Two years down the line, that business becomes a multi-million dollar business. So you just may never know. But I, like I said, it's a personal decision. Look at all the numbers, things are looking up, you are suffering. And I, I'm always big on people's mental health, please. Yes, you're running a business. Yes, you're trying to build something out of you. But if your mental health is suffering, I beg, I beg, I beg, take a break. 
Because you, at the end of the day, you are the one that you're the visionary for the business. You're the one that is pushing the business. If you're, if everything is not right with you, the business probably will suffer too. So also protect yourself and protect your headspace. Okay, so we uh, we're almost short of time, but then let's see if we can just fit in one more question because our next speaker is meant to join us right now. So um, two two questions here. See. What is a bootstrap business? I think that was already answered earlier. And then another said, what are investors looking out for from founders and businesses in a pre-seed round? Um, so I, I mentioned a couple of these things in you know, that the slide I talked about how to have a winning pitch. Um, but I, I just go, I just talk about everything very quickly. So some added things very quickly, apart from the things I talked about. Um, I know I mentioned the team. Team is very important, your team composition. Investors want to see that you have the team that can grow this business. Now, one of the mistakes I see founders make is that they, they try to fill their team with people like them. That's such a big mistake. We're looking at teams that have complementary skills, people that plug gaps in the business. If the founder is a core tech guy, who is going to do his marketing? Is his co-founder a marketer? Or his co-founder have experience in marketing? Um, who is going to manage operations? Like we want to ensure that the team can build the business. The team has grit, the team has experience to build the business. Um, we look at the revenue model and the business model, it doesn't even make sense, right? It has to make sense. Um, we look at the regulatory landscape. You are trying to build ride healing or bike healing in Lagos. We know that that's most likely a failure from the get go. Um, so sometimes you even go and talk to your competitors in the market to ensure that, to see, to, honest, to try to see what they are building and try to see how you are different from them. So, what, what exactly is your differentiator? So what exactly is your unique selling point? What makes you different from the the, the competitors or the competitions that exist in the market. Um, well, what else would, would I add to, to what I said earlier? Uh, yeah, that, if you, everything in total is simplistic term is what, is what people are looking at because at the pre seed seed stage, to be honest, there's really nothing, yeah, the data points that we look at can be very few um, but it could also be very detailed determined depending on the type of business you're building. If it's a tech business, I'd one that wrote the code. Um, even if is 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 you you got someone to develop your app, is there a plan for you to have that resource in-house? Because we've had cases where developers locked founders out of their code, out of their software. Um, yeah, and it, yeah. And if you check my Instagram page, I, I, I write some of these things on my Instagram page. So I use my Instagram page to teach some of these things over time. Okay. Thank you so much, Owem. Thank you so, so yeah. much for your time. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time out to come and share these tips with us. Would we expect in the version of the slide that we can share to the attendees? After, after the session. So once again, thank you so much for your time. We really You're welcome. It. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right, thank you. So we're moving on to our second speaker for the day, um, Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe. So Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe is the Lekidia Institute. Uh, he invented and patented the robot system which the US states government, the United States government acquired as any rights to. He holds two doctoral and four master's degree, including a PhD in engineering from John Hopkins University, USA. He earned an undergraduate degree from Federal University of Technology, where he graduated as his class best student. While at Anal Analog Digital School, he co-designed an accelerometer for the iPhone. He's a recipient of the IGI Global Book of the Year Award, a TED Fellow, an IBM Global Entrepreneur and World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. He has held professorships in Babcock University, Craig Mellon University, and served in the United States National Science Foundation Committee. So please, let's welcome Professor Ndubisi Ekekwe for his talk on scaling businesses.
Okay, thank you so much. Please, if it's possible, you could just uh, give me the right to share my screen. Thank you. Yes, you, you have right, sir. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll also momentarily just put on my camera, turn it off later on. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's quite a moment and a privilege to have the opportunity of speaking with you all in this capacity. I'm DBC, okay, I'm speaking from United States of America and uh, thank you um, for the team eh, at your service uh, for this conversation. I'll be speaking on the broad topic of the SME playbook, essentially looking at how businesses scale. And I'll be sharing experiences from my own. I'm an entrepreneur, so I've started companies. <clears throat> and also uh, in what we do in Tequila Capital, we are uh, we've been investing in startups. I think by now we have more than nearly 35 companies that we have invested. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have data, we have data systems that actually give us insights to what I would say that what happened and how things are happening within the ecosystem. So, but for us to talk about scaling your business, let me take you back to the most important elements and how everything begins. Why do we even need to have a business? Why do we need to have a company? Why do we need to wake up one morning and someone says, I have to put on my suit. I have to go to work. The whole nexus here is understanding the purpose and the mission of farms. Because it's only when we understand the purpose and mission of farms, that's when we begin to say, how do we now scale our operations in companies? How do we now actually do what we said that we want to do? You know, in any market, you have what they call demand. You also have what they call supply. But there is one big problem in every market. Market systems are impact. And because market systems are imperfect, there is an information asymmetry. That information asymmetry essentially says that there is something the demand knows that the supply does not know. And there is something the supply knows that the demand does not know. And then how do you bridge that gap? It turns out that only companies have the capacity to do that. Let me give you an example. I always use this example a lot. I have just landed in Lagos and, and I don't have any family member in Lagos. And unfortunately, there is no restaurant in Lagos. If we assume that there is no restaurant in Lagos and NDBC does not have someone who can give him food because there is no family member. The only option I have will be to begin to knock at every door in Lagos. I knock at the first door, I knock at the second door, I knock at the third door, I knock at the fourth door. Of course, you will agree with me that this system and that process is inherently non-productive because there are propensity that I can actually knock the first 10 doors and there will not be food to be sold or to be available for me. So at the same time, I'm knocking at the door looking for somebody who can sell food. There is also someone who has food to sell, but I can find that individual. So because of that dislocation, that information asymmetry, I know I'm hungry. The person knows that he has food to sell. You have an issue. So what happens? Somebody now says, okay, I'm going to start a restaurant. I'm going to call it Mama Kemi's restaurant. She opens the restaurant. And now, anytime I'm hungry, instead of knocking at people's door, I just go to that restaurant. You know what's happened there? That restaurant has served a purpose, making it possible that I don't have to knock at any door. I just go to that restaurant to go and buy food. And that restaurant is a business. That restaurant is a farm. That restaurant is a company. And that is what companies do. So if we understand these constructs, that companies actually exist to fix a friction, we typically exist between demand and supply. It means that what we want to do we can actually go into the market because companies help now to bring that efficiency in the utilization of factors of production. That ordinance of fixing the relationship between demand and supply costs across industrial sectors 
If something happens in banking, I have got one million naira. I don't know what to do with it in late. I'm ready to lend it to somebody who can pay me 10% interest rate at the end of for one year. And at the end of the day, I can't find somebody who can borrow that money from me. At the same time, there is a, a, a poultry farmer somewhere in New York who also needs money, but he can't find me. So what happens? A young man wakes up and say, I'm starting a bank. And then the BC takes that one million. The bank pays me ten percent. And then that person who needs that one million New York goes to the bank to borrow that money, and the bank charges seventeen percent. The debt out of seven is essentially the cost the bank has imposed in the system because the bank has fixed inflation, which existed between me and that individual. So that's what companies exist. They exist to solve frictions, which are evident in market system. The frictions could be you want to borrow money, you can't find it, so you go to the bank. The friction could be you are hungry, you want to eat food. Instead of looking around city, you go to a restaurant. The restaurant has now fixed a friction. It could be that you want to buy Indomie noodles. Unfortunately, if there is no Indomie noodle company, you can't find where to buy noodles. So the friction now is being fixed by Dufi or the company that makes Indomie noodles. It could also be in education. Your child has just turned six, five years and the child needs to go to school. Imagine if there is no school, how are you going to train that child? In other words, when schools open up, they are coming into the market to fix inflation, which is to enable people to go to school. And that is the purpose of those farms. The question I have for you today, what is your own mission in the market? What do you want to accomplish? What is it that has made you to open your door? There are so many domains of friction, trading, manufacturing, so many things we do every day. But one thing is evident. We need to fix friction. We need to accumulate capabilities and we need to move into the new frontier. That capability essentially is saying that before you can fix that friction, before you can open that restaurant, before you can become a banking institution, there are things people expect you to know. There are capabilities that are expected of you. You need to understand the business of bank. Otherwise, you can't be a good bank. You need to understand how to make good food. Maybe you cook a rikoi koi. I think it's one they make in a pipe on your side. You know, it's always one of the best food you can eat. Or maybe you make jello fries. So you need to have capabilities how to make them because if you do not have the capabilities of making them, you are not going to efficiently fix that friction which has existed in the market. In other words, if people come into the restaurant to eat food and you are preparing food just like NBC will prepare, there will be problem. They will say, I'll pay you, but I'll go and just stay on my fasting because I don't want to eat this food. In other words, capabilities are critical in market system because through these capabilities, then we can fix the friction. So the gears of all comes down to two things. You need to see the playbook of the business. The playbook of the business is, I have a purpose to exist in this particular market. I have a purpose to exist in this industrial sector. I have a purpose to exist and participate in this specific domain in the market system. And that participation will involve how do I do things differently from how every other person is doing it? And that is where they call it setting a new basis of competition, finding a way to do something fairly different. Because if you are opening up to pursue a mission in a market and you are doing what people are already doing, you agree with me that you may not have any competitive advantage. It means that You've not actually differentiated what you are coming to do in that particular market system. So you need to come up with a new plan. It turns out today, technology has become an enabler, making it possible that individuals who are going to set up farms can actually come up with better ways of doing things. And as you do those things, you begin to now serve these customers at a better level. You know, serving customers at a better level is very critical because that is actually how you begin to grow the business. It means that more people will be coming to buy food from, 
Mama Kemi's restaurant. It means that the young man that started a bank, more people will be coming open bank account because they are getting value, they're getting services, and that business continues to grow. So when you are doing that, it means that you are serving customers and customers are happier and then growth begins to happen in that business. But there is something that will never change. There needs to be a friction. There needs to be a need in the market system that you as a company wants to do. And it comes down to these elements. In the, the economics second, in secondary school, they must call them factors of production. And how do you combine them? How do you reunify everything that you need in order to create a product or service that those customers can actually feel? Because there is only one way in this world to overcome a market friction. If you have studied physics in secondary school, you know that friction is a force. And how do you overcome a force? You apply another force. In markets, in business, the only way to overcome the needs of customer, which is a force, is to create a product, a service. When you create a product or service, you now begin to overcome those frictional forces that the customers have. And that's how you begin to advance your, your capacity as a business. So you need to have knowledge. Knowledge is extremely critical. When I say you need to have knowledge, I mean that you need to have the capacity to think differently. You know, yeah, the, the founder of uh, Apple would uh, think differently. You need to have knowledge. It's a very critical part in a knowledge economy because at the end of everything, if you cannot come up with a better way of doing things, you cannot change your market. And this is consistent across human history. The empires of the future, the empires of the past have been built on new knowledge. You are never going to be better than the other guy if you are not coming up with a new playbook. That new playbook means there is a new knowledge system that you are bringing to participate in that. The best they do today in America is not because we know them that they make good bonds. The best they do today in America because when you go to places like MIT, Harvard, Princeton, you see new knowledge systems that are being created. You see new knowledge systems that are being deployed into the economy. And when a nation or when a company cannot create new knowledge, you stall. I always say this. It is better to build minds of knowledge than to build minds of hydrocarbons, than to build minds of crude oil, than to build minds of oil and gas. When nations are built on knowledge, they advance and they can do great. So of course, if you have knowledge, you need to have entrepreneurial capitalism. Entrepreneurial capitalism, the whole construct of taking raw materials, taking the inputs necessary for the market system and turn them into products and services. Entrepreneurs are the pioneers who can combine all these things together so that at the end of the day, they will have products and services. So it's not just about the knowledge. Oh, the professor just wrapped they know so much in that country. They have so many think tanks in that country. At the end of the day, do you have the do tanks? We cannot all be thinking. We cannot all be doing think tanks. We also need the do tanks. The do tanks are the people that actually get things done. You have that policy document as a government. You have that strategy document as a company. Do you have the capacity to execute and turn those ideas into product services that customers can buy so that they can fix the frictions which are evident in their lives. As a company, you want to scale. What is your knowledge system? Are you creating new knowledge? Are you finding better ways of serving your customers? Are you finding how to fix and connect all those inefficiencies in markets and how you are going to flood the path and overcome? Are you coming up with a pioneering mindset that no matter what happens, we are going to win? When you say that losing is not an option, the only thing there is you have to win. Of course, we know these things that they have to happen because for you to scale a business, for you to have that XME playbook, you have to do most important two things. You need to have awesome products and you need to have superior execution. There can never be a greater company in the world that does not have good products, 
and that does not have the ability to get things done. No matter whatever thing you have done, no matter whatever strategy document, no matter anything or courses or sections you've attended, at the end of the day, it comes down to one thing. Great products, awesome products will produce great companies. When you talk about Microsoft, you remember Windows. When you talk about the Apple, you remember the iPhone. When you talk about Google, you talk about the Google side. When you talk about Dango, you remember Dango, Disney. When you talk about the Dufio, remember Indomino. When you, so there can never be a great company without an awesome product. In other words, you need to find a mechanism to build products and services that can actually deliver value in the market system. And then, of course, delivering them in ways that are good. And it comes down to having this playbook and you don't have a big idea. The big idea is looking at the constellation of all the challenges and the frictions in the market. And how are you going to fix them? In Nigeria, we have so many of them, so many of them, right from the time you wake up in the morning and the, and, and the time you sleep and the mosquitoes are fighting you. And then the electricity is also discouraging you. There's so many big, there's so many opportunities. The question is that what idea do you have to go after them? And when you have formulated that idea, can you build a team? A superb team is necessary. And then of course, from those superb teams, you build an awesome product. And then as you build the awesome product, the key thing there is superior execution. It's also key to understand one thing here, that it's not just about being smart. Business is not about who is the most intelligent guy in the class. It's not about who made first class or who was always coming top of his class. Business is really about who can identify problems that most people have and figure out how to efficiently serve those people rapidly and scale at a point that you can make money. So that's why when you look at legends like, like Tony Lumelu, look at Jim Ovia, look at uh, uh, Dan Gote using Nigeria examples, and then you come to the United States, you see Melaje Bezos of Amazon, you see all these guys at Elon Musk. What is happening there is this. They may not have even been the best in their classics when they attended university or secondary school. But what has happened here is that they have this great vision of anticipating and understanding markets and then having the ability to mobilize resources to go and create products and at the end of the day sustain a superior execution at the end of the day. So if they do that and they keep doing that, the, the, the stars will align. And that's what happens. When I say superior execution, I'm also looking at business frameworks. You know, you know like we uh, do in Tekidia Mini MBA, we, we, we explain these frameworks. I mean, so many of them. And because your framework, how you can actually take that product to the market, is as important as the product that you have created. Let me give a very good example. Around, um, um, around, 20, around 2013, 2014 or thereabouts, uh, Microsoft had the CEO, his name uh, is, is CEO Steve Barmer. And Steve Barmer, um, uh, the market cap of Microsoft that time was around $336 billion. And he had his whole philosophy that um, if Windows could not win in mobile, that the world should certainly forget about mobile. So he didn't want to do anything with Apple. He didn't want to do anything with Google because Google has Android, which has one in the mobile. And also iOS, Apple has iOS, which has also one. But Google, unfortunately for Microsoft, Microsoft Windows mobile did not do well. So he just believed, oh, it didn't work out. Let's just leave these guys and let's just stay with what we have Windows. But they changed him and brought uh, Satya Nadella a new CEO. You know what happened? The man took the same product. And today, that $336 billion company is worth at least $2 trillion. In other words, uh, Mr. Satya was able to turn $336 billion into $2 trillion in just less than uh, seven, six years. So what has happened, he didn't create any new product that was not available in Microsoft. He just used a, a different framework where Apple, if you have millions and billions of people in your ecosystem, Microsoft will be there. Google, 
If you have millions and billions in ecosystem, Microsoft will be there. I don't care whether you are an enemy in the past. All I just want to do, I want to come and sell. In other words, he had this whole new philosophy that is not really about whether iOS belong to Microsoft or Android belong. If there are people there that I can come and do business, hey, let's go and do business. You know, it's just like an Igbo man when you go to a labor market, you want to buy something, and he tells you there is this, the other store. As, as you know, there is never the other store. That store, he didn't own any other store. What happened there that the electronics you want to buy at Alaba, he doesn't have it. The other store is always the other store. But when you now move to the other store, hey, he makes a deal. So that's what Microsoft was saying. There is the other store. If you don't like it in the store here, which is your laptop or your desktop, the other store is the Apple iOS. The other store is the Android. And you know what? They have turned a business that's lagged for years into a $2 trillion business. And that is one thing I want you to understand here, that growing a business is not about physics of the esoteric that you need mathematical, which could be another brilliant mathematicians to solve. Building a business, just basic fundamentals. Where can I find more customers? And let me take out my ego or how I feel. Provided the customers are there to pay, we are going to have a good party. It's very key because if I go to Lagos now, to University of Lagos, I go to Futo and ask the students between IBM and Microsoft, which one is a better company? Which one is a better technology company? I promise you that many Futo students or many OAU students or many ABU students, many University of Potaco students will say, hey, IBM makes better engineering products. IBM is a rocket. They make this quantum computer. They make IBM Watson. But you know what? The market cap of IBM, the last I checked, maybe last week or so, was $120 billion. $120 billion. And, and Microsoft is worth $2 trillion. So what am I telling you here? It's not about the sophistication of your engineering. It's not about how you are building things that people don't need. You want to build quantum computer, you want to build the few. It's about fixing problems that customers have. And if you do that as well, you are going to get to that mountaintop. And one thing that is key here for you to scale that business is the capacity to take your customers on a journey. I have written extensively on that in Harvard, where I stated it's about going beyond the needs, going beyond the expectation to the perceptions of your customers. Perceptions of your customers are giving customers sometimes things they never anticipated they need. But the day they see those products and services, they begin to become fans. It's about taking them to become not just customers, but to become fans. When a business gets into the world of fandom, fandom here means you have made them to become apostles to yourself. You have taken them onto a journey where they see a world beyond themselves. So I give you a great, great example. iPhone is a very good example. You know, a young man lives in Lake in, in US, and there is a day that iPhone is, Apple is going to launch a new iPhone. What most of them do is that they take a day out of work. Interestingly, if he's working an hourly wage, he will not be paid that day. But he wants to go to do one thing. He wants to go to buy a new iPhone. He takes a day out of work. He's losing weight. He leaves his house in New York City in winter, very cold weather, 4 a.m. in the morning. He has got the best buy. As he gets the best buy, he queues because there were other people before him. And maybe he gets finally around 9 a.m. And when he gets, he gives them a salary, his two weeks of salary, what he has earned in two weeks. He gives him a credit card, they give him a, a new iPhone. And he comes and he has wired his apartment with, with uh, cameras, uh, takes pictures and posts them on LinkedIn. I say, hey, friends, I have the new iPhone. Any man or woman that does that is not just a customer. That person is a fan. It is your responsibility if you want to grow your playbook. How do you make your customers to become fans? How do you build a fandom in the lives of your customer? And there are so many companies there in Lagos. I always give this one 
when Diamond Bank invented the integrated banking system, you deposit money in one branch of Diamond Bank, irrespective of the location, you can operate that bank account. You know, there used to be a time, ladies and gentlemen, when in the old Union Bank, in the old First Bank, in Nigeria, if you put money in, uh, in, in Alaba or in Lagos and you travel to Kanu, if you run out of cash, you can't go to the next branch of First Bank in Kanu to ask for fund. They will ask you to go back to Lagos, go to the specific branch where you open that bank account before you can get money. Today, that's not the case because they have integrated the banking system, making even where you open the bank account to be irrelevant. That is a perception product because no one even imagined the possibility of that happening because that was the world we were used to, that you have to own a bank account in a branch of a bank, and that is the only place you can operate it. So question for you is this, how are you going to create your perception? So let me just uh, run through this, and it comes down to building what I call a new basis of competition. And there are so many vistas in the market systems where we can participate in this. As you look at the Nigerian economy, we have underperformed as a people. We have underperformed. We have a GDP of less than 500 billion, and we have a population of nearly 210 million people. In the real sense, Nigerian GDP should not be anything less than $3 trillion. So there are opportunities in agriculture, healthcare, education, and technology, of course, looking at so many elements. But it's going to be a factor. And let me just summarize by saying this. We need to have the ability to transform our businesses. Transforming our businesses here will mean building products and services that can actually help us grow the business. And, and uh, we are moving into the application utility era. We've gone through the, the mobile internet era. So there are going to be massive shift in how opportunities are opening up in the nation. So I want us to see that future even as the new opportunities begin to, to emerge in the nation, the, the opportunities of, 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 of digitization, the opportunity of hybridization, of, the opportunity of looking at how do we build better supply systems and then creating companies of the future that will help us to advance. And to drive growth and also have an enduring company, I've listed some very critical four things that we can do when you are looking at category king companies. In other words, you want to grow, you want to be sustainable. You need to have innovation. You have to be customer of sex. You need to have the capacity to be ruthlessly pragmatic. As you promise, so the products and services will be. You don't promise them that the product will last for two days. And all of a sudden, somebody opens it within an hour, it has gone. So there are so many core things we need to do in order for us to drive that. So finally, I'm always an apostle. When you are talking of growth, the key thing you ask yourself, how is my marginal cost performing? Marginal cost is the cost of serving an additional customer. The best thing that can happen in a business is when, if you are increasing your revenue, if you are increasing your user base, your distribution and transaction cost, Distribution and transaction cost is basically your marginal cost. If you can keep this distribution and transaction cost largely flat, you are really going to be a very, very great company. You are going to be very profitable. You don't even need to raise tons of money from investors. In short, raising money from investors, if you can have this type of trajectory, will not really be a very, very great idea because you are growing users, ramping up revenue, and at the end of the day, your distribution and marginal cost drops. But if you are running one stupid business model, where as you are growing users, you're growing revenue, and your marginal cost is also tracking the hypothesis, you are going to be in a very big problem. So it comes down to having a curve that looks like what we have in the right. Users are increasing. The marginal cost becomes asymptotic. Asymptotic is a, is a term they use in mathematics where a point, a curve doesn't reach a line, but it keeps getting closer to the line. But unlike this one, which is the typical thing we have in marginal cost, as a result of scale, the, the cost drops, but over time it begins to rise. So your ability to scale, your ability to scale that business, 
you need to see how you begin to have. Because if you can get into the one by the right this time, you are going to have a very good scalable advantage. Let me say this. There is physics in what can determine how a business will scale. OK, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, OK, so thank you. I think that's my last slide. And um, I'm a counter. Thank you so much for the opportunity of having this uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ndubisi. Thank you so much for such a um, in concise and really detailed um, talk. We actually still have about 10 minutes. So thank you for keeping for keeping to time. So the, the floor is now open for question and answer um, for the question and answer session. And like I said at the start, you can type your questions in the chat box and um, Prof would respond to whatever question you have. So please, if you have a question, quickly type that in the chat box so that we can answer that um, shortly. So please, if you have a question, kindly um, share that in the chat box. Okay, so we have our first question and that's from Brian. He said, if we get our marginal cost to zero or near zero, then profit is inevitable, right? So he's asking what happens when marginal cost is at zero or near zero? Does that mean that profit is inevitable? Or is that okay. contribute to that? Yeah, so I think the key thing there is not just necessarily profit. Uh, but what happens here is that growth becomes easier for you to have. So let's give you, let me give you a practical example. Uh, if you have read many things I've written about e-commerce in Africa, I do not believe that e-commerce in Africa is a good business today. The reason being that the marginal cost within the e-commerce space in, let's say in Lagos is not online, the marginal cost, which is the distribution cost and the transaction cost, both those components, you can actually find them offline. If I buy something from Jumia, Jumia has to send that thing from a warehouse or Jumia has to work with a merchant that is delivering that thing to send to me. That is a huge cost that is not captured Online. So that's, if you look at it, e commerce business in Lagos is not an online business. It's not a digital business. It's not, it's rather, it is actually a physical business because you have to move that item from one place to the other. So if you are selling to more people, your problems compound. Your distribution cost begins to rise up because you do not have the mechanism of actually improving on that. But if I'm selling the same thing in the United States where there is a postal service, my business to a large extent becomes, let me call it an online business. Because my own job is to find people to buy. And once they have bought at the end of the day, I package everything they have bought, I just take it to the US postal service, they take care of it. I don't have to get involved in the dealing with the distribution, whether the thing will reach to the destination. All I know is that I have gotten customers online and now I am taking these customers to, uh, I'm going to package the goods sent to the US Postal Service, US Postal Service Center. So I have a better chance of scaling my e-commerce business, let's say in the United States, because the distribution cost for me the United States Postal Service has a, to a large extent taken it away from me. Whether 30 people bought today or 1,000 people bought today or 50,000 people will buy today or anyhow, it's irrelevant because the US Postal Service has a capacity to carry millions 
of buses of things every day. But in Nigeria, if you are serving one person, all of a sudden 20 people come along, 1,000 people, what do you do? You keep adding more bikes. You keep adding more vans. You keep adding more staff. You, all of a sudden, a digital business that was supposed to be asset light, you now begin to see many, many people riding bikes, many people driving vans, and you start. So at the end of the day, it's no more an asset light business. It's no more a digital business. It's no more an ele electronic business. It's now a typical kind of Dangote kind of industrial age business where you pile in a lot of assets because your distribution cost, which is your marginal cost, is not very efficient. So that is the reason why e-commerce companies, they bound their geography. They cannot deliver to my village in other states. So how can you be a digital business in a country and you can't serve the whole part of the country? The reason why they cannot deliver to my village in other states is because they want to reduce that distribution cost, which is the marginal cost, because they cannot send an Okada man to ride from Lagos to go to Adia State to deliver that item in my village. So that means that they are not nationwide operating digital business, which is supposed to be that if you are running a business online, you should have the capacity to serve every part of the country. But in Amazon, in e-commerce companies in America, they serve every part of America because they have a postal service that actually takes care of serving every part of America. So on your profit model, you are going to struggle if you have a business that the distribution cost rises with your volume, rises with the number of users. That means that your marginal cost does not drop towards near zero. And that means you can't run a good business. That's why making money and becoming profitable in an e-commerce business in a place like Nigeria is going to be extremely very difficult. I hope I did not confuse that I tried just to use practical example to explain. Yeah, so profitability is tough, but if your marginal cost continues to drop near zero, let's say you have an API and your API, you have built this API, whether three people are using the API, 20,000 people are using the API, it's the same API. It means that the cost of adding an additional user goes towards zero, it doesn't cost you much. Hey, you are going to be very, very profitable. And that is actually the kind of businesses that people like to invest in because the future is certainly awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for that great explanation. So uh, we have a question. It says, there is a popular saying, think big, start small, scale fast. Can you comment on the importance of fast scaling and how a business can be careful to not scale too fast. Yeah, yeah. So um, I am not a very good apostle of bliss scaling in places like Africa, bliss scaling, uh, sub Saharan Africa. Uh, but I'm a, an apostle of bliss scaling in places like New York, London, Silicon Valley, Paris, and co. The reason being that if if you make a mistake in Lagos as an entrepreneur, most times time you don't get any forgiveness. You just collapse. Just look at Conga. All of a sudden, they couldn't raise more money and they had to shut down. But look at WeWork. WeWork made tons of mistakes, but they are still in business because the pipeline to, to funding in the United States, for example, there are more pipelines how they can get this funding. But in our own case, we don't have that privilege of having this asset capital. So what that means here that we have to be nuanced when we are growing our business. You know, I've seen some founders in Lagos, they want to grow rapidly, they want to move very fast. Then there is a little trip, all of a sudden, their fund dries up. And when that fund dries up, no investor wants to come in because there are, there are very few of them to start with. And because there are very few of them, those that have invested have been burnt, they don't want to show up. If you look at the most successful business people in Nigeria, they're actually very boring people. <laughs> and when you look at Dan Gote, <laughs> look at all these movies, what do they do? They get into a sector. They find a path to profitability as quickly as possible. They stay the course. They stay the course. They try to protect, keep working. They are not into this whole construct, oh, we're gonna just open up 
uh, seven African countries in one year. We're, we're going to, you're just stretching yourself, pursuing markets. Sometimes you are faster in your growth model than the market. I mean, if you have an economy of uh, 400 or 500 billion, billion GDP in Nigeria, and you want to scale it using the playbook of somebody who is operating in, I think the US GDP is about at least 25 trillion. You know, I say, hey guys, it doesn't really work that way because Lagos could be the sixth largest economy in Africa if it's a country. If you get out of Lagos, you're taking Potak River State, taking Lagos, taking Abuja, Kanu, Onichaba, or uh, Ibadan. I mean, <laughs> it, it gets harder. <laughs> Then you now want to now start opening up <laughs> maybe my village so that you can say we are in that <laughs> You are in trouble. You are scaling without adding any value because you want to have your ego. Oh, we have 400 people now in our company. Who cares how many people are working there? <laughs> so the thing here is not just this whole liturgy of let me rapidly get into as many states, as many countries as possible. That's not the way I say it. But if you live in a place like US, where, I mean, the economy of Michigan state, I think is even bigger than the whole economy of Nigeria. That's just a state. And the amount of electricity they use in a city in Florida is bigger than the whole electricity they use in Nigeria. And they have thousands of these kind of cities all over the country. You can scale because there is element of value that could be captured in those cities. But it's not like scaling where there is no value that becomes what makes things very difficult. So I will ask us to be very, very careful. Look at how the banks, how disciplined they are. Look at how the, the successful banks that inspire you. It took years and decades for GT Bank to even branch out of Nigeria. Even so these companies are not just growing. They have the money, but they understand it's not about scaling when you cannot capture value. It's not about, you know, there is a plot I would have shown you here, but I don't have it handy. Um, the best pricing point in Nigeria is really pricing something within 80. Uh, there is a little shift. It's, it's, a, it's a Gaussian distribution. And if you are out of that range, you're in trouble. And that's how Biggie Cola was able to, to challenge Coca-Cola in Nigeria. Because Biggie Cola gave people bigger bottle and lower cost. And all of a sudden, Coca-Cola could not find how to challenge, to compete, because that is what it's all about. And if you look at Biggie Cola, they are not in every part of the country. And then they were very, very successful. So move very, 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 very measured, and not just be in the whole construct that you have to ramp up very quickly, because that is what they do in Silicon Valley. No, it doesn't work that way. I have this philosophy that you have to find value. And when you see opportunity for value, you go for it. Thank you. OK, um, thank you so much, Prof, for that response. So we have someone asking if we would have access to, if they will have access to the slides after after this time. Yes, yes, of course. I will, uh, just after that, just send it. I will, will send you the PDF. All right, thank you so much. And then the person is also asking, is it possible to scale fast and sustain the process? I think you just answered that um, in the response that you gave to the other question. So I'll move to the next one. And the person says, um, Prof, what advice, what piece of advice would you give a service business that is looking at scaling? What are the things to consider and look out for? A service business that is looking at scaling, what are the things to consider and look out for? Okay, I think that's a very good question because um, that is actually a very important foundational thing for a service business. I believe in partnership. <clears throat> I believe in growing a business through partnership. And growing through partnership means you are going to conserve cost. You are going to have the opportunity of taking lesser risk directly. And you can actually, if things work out very well, at compete your competitors who want to do everything by themselves. I'll give you a very practical example. Um, using the, um, our company, one of our businesses, Tekidia uh, Mini MBA. In Tekidia Mini MBA, we have country partners in every country in Africa. They help us bring in students, members, 
they bundle hundreds of people from Malawi, Botswana. And when they bring them, they register them. We don't, they even have bank accounts, they collect the money from us. That is a very good example of growing partnership. Because if we have to do that, we have to set off an operation in Malawi, Botswana. At the end of the day, it doesn't make sense. So if you are in service business, like say in Lagos, that could be a company, like say in Sokoto, if you were interested in Sokoto, that you could explore how both of you will work together. But the difficulty we have in place like Nigeria is that we, are, we don't trust people. We don't trust ourselves very well. So it's always the issue, um, uh, this person will cheat me. But if you cannot trust people, there's just no way you're going to do business because that is part of business. Business is about relationship with human beings because every company you see on earth, actually that company represents people. So if you don't want to trust, uh, get a lawyer, one page document, put down in a piece of paper, say, this is what we'll expect. Spend more time understanding what each person has to deliver your other person. If you look at Florida Wave, the reason why Florida Wave is a billion dollar business today, is not because it's doing what other people are not doing. The reason why Florida Wave is such a very wonderful company is that GB and his team, you know, they have actually built a web concatenating the world of payment around Florida Wave. If you are looking at Asia, they have a partnership with Alibaba. If you are looking at uh, Europe, they have World Pay. If you're looking at North America, they have PayPal. I think there is also one they have with uh, uh, Latin America. So that is a business. If they have decided to go and build these things by themselves one by one, promise you, they will not have been in a position where somebody is pricing them $1 billion. So service businesses need to open up a partnership playbook. We don't do that a lot. And I'll give you an example. Look at IBM. IBM for years was doing business in Nigeria. IBM was never doing the business directly by IBM. IBM was using what they call, um, I mean, in a, in a, in a, to a large extent, we call them channel partners. Channel partners are nothing but go and represent me in this country. Deal, we deal with the, the trouble of the customers for me. At the end of the day, we share revenue. If you have a service business, why don't you do it? Why don't you develop it? And that is the playbook of the 21st century because the best businesses of the 21st century, they have a unified gene that is consistent they are built on aggregation. There is something that in the 20 top companies in the world in the technology space, they have one thing that is common. And if you are doing something outside that uniformity, that means you are not organizing your company around that particular framework which the world is already using. If from WeChat to Facebook to Apple to even Microsoft to Google, all of them have element of aggregation. And that aggregation, why they can have it within the space of technology, there is an aggregation in building partnership, building partnership. And that means you don't have to spend so much building a team. I am not a person that derives so much joy that a guy is ramping up number of workers. I'm not saying that people shouldn't get a job, but I'm saying here that don't derive so much joy because you are now employing 100 people. On point 200 people, there are, there are people that want to introduce their company to me. I say, now we have grown to 87 people. I say, why is that really a, a, a statistics? <laughs> what is so big that you've grown 87 people? The most, that's because you are actually running a business model where you are not efficiently utilizing the factors of production because you want to have a representative you are in pay in Malawi, in Botswana, and you want to have one in Ethiopia when you would have used another company to represent you in Malawi. And that company may have 10 people. So technically that your 87 people, if you use it the other way, you could have actually employed 807 people indirectly or directly. Because those, that company will also employ people. So this does not mean that you are not giving people opportunity to work in a company. You may even be given opportunity for more people to work, but you organize it in a way 
that your cost model becomes very, very efficient. There is nothing better in a business when your marginal cost becomes very efficient. A company rises when the marginal cost efficiency is high. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you once again, Pro, for that response. So we have um, a couple more questions, about five of them. So someone is asking, how do you know when you're ready to scale up? How do you know when you're ready to scale up? Actually, is a, your antenna, every business has a, a, an antenna. Antenna means you receive signal what the customers are asking for. It's actually the simplest thing to know. Anytime you are serving customers and going home becomes a distraction. <laughs> you know that is the moment because it means that the customers have unified around you. They like what we're doing. And that means that you have to do what? Answer that. You know, so that's where you know that scaling has come because the customers are asking for it. Unfortunately, if the other side, if customers are not interested in what you're doing, you certainly can't see any, any pause for you to begin to scale. So it comes down to seeing that there is a huge level of interest and traction. And then scaling is to provide the services that these customers are looking for in places that you have not even started operation. So you go and say, because the market has given you a validation that the hypothesis upon which you started this business, that you got it right. And I just give an example here, let's say for instance, in, in our program in, in Tequila in MBA, we run 24 seven customer service. And when initially we didn't even know that anybody will write to us. <laughs> but when we now saw that people in Afghanistan, people in uh, even in, 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 in London, they were registering for our program, I said, wow. And if you say this is an online program, and you don't want to start creating an impression that they have to, to, to yeah, let's, let's just add an extra person that can work in the night so that, because we have so many people there. So that is when you know you need to scale. So that, what does scaling means differs. Scaling could mean having more customer support. Scaling could mean finding more partners in a locality you are not. Scaling could mean so many things, but, you need when the customers are showing that they're interested in what you do. You know, if you see a woman that makes uh, uh, ice cream in Lagos and she's producing one, one, let me just use one, one truck and the other coming in is maybe five trucks. <laughs> I mean, no one tells her, Madam, now is the time to go and increase the factory capacity. Now is the time to go and increase the number of workers because you're producing one carton uh, one truck and five trucks or that coming daily. So that's when you know that. Customers tell you that. All right. Um, thank you, Prof. I think that also answers another question we had here about whether people should go to markets where there's already a proven demand or markets that have unproven markets um, or unproven demand. I think that also answers that. So yeah. once- Yeah, but question. let me add, let, let me okay. add that. Um, there, there is something that is very, very important. It, there, is, um, there is a strategy I've written, I call it the, the free range chicken. Uh, I don't know, most of you grew, grew up in the town. Some of us that grew up in the village, uh, we are actually better off uh, <laughs> because we ate real chicken. <laughs> you know, the free range chicken is the chicken in the village. You wake up in the morning, you just go to the hut where they live, that small place, open it. The chicken will just go and feed itself. In the night, it comes back. You just go and cover that little, little hole because you don't want uh, reptiles to get into where the chicken sleeps and kill it. So that free range chicken constructs is a business framework where you can actually enter into new territories where there may not have been people there. You can be the one that pioneered it. So what I'm trying to say here, let's not restrict scaling within the angle there must be existing customer that we already know. Let's also look at scaling that you can be the one that will stimulate that customer. Like when Google talks about, Google does not say, let me go into Facebook market. Let me go to Apple market. They say, we want to build a new 1 billion market. In other words, they have to come up with something that does not exist so that they can capture 1 billion people as their customer. It is easier to go to your village and tell everyone in the village to follow you to the moon than to tell everyone in the village, follow me, let's go and dig a ground in another village. <laughs> in other words, you are going to be successful 
building a very good customer base, if you come up with something new, then going to build a good customer base within something that is already in existence. So the Paystar guys created their own new market. It's a category. The Florida Wave guys created their own. If they have gone to start another face bank, another union bank, they will not have that opportunity. Just like the free range chicken does not disturb you every day. It goes for his own business. It's not like your dog or your cat. The dog will wait, expect you to feed it in the morning, feed it in the afternoon, feed it in the night. But the chicken doesn't have time for that. You need to have ability to go into uncontested markets. And that means you can actually simulate a demand that is latent that does not exist currently. That, that's a very good point. So it doesn't have to exist. You can create it. iPhone created a new market when iPhone was created. The market iPhone enjoys in the iOS was not really there until iPhone came. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for that. So someone had sent um, a question privately. He said, how can an innovator deal with draconian policies like we have in a country like Nigeria? Um, interestingly, uh, actually, there are policies, but I actually think it's easier to start a business it's easier to start a business in New York than, of course, to start in a place like Lagos. So since you can, uh, within one week, in short, if you are in, in Delaware, within two days, you can register a business. <laughs> but it's easier to grow a business in Lagos, the largest thing than it's easier in some cases in, in, in New York, London, because there are just many things that you can not just get into. They have perfected most things. The markets have matured. The markets have saturated. What are you going to offer new to people in New York? What are you going to offer you? But if you come to a place like Nigeria, <laughs> both the government is confused, both the market is evolving, that means you are going to see a state of flaws because there is no maturity, there is no stabilization. The government policies basically saying some of these things we do not understand the implication but when we see we need to calibrate of course we would have wished they are more consultative in the way they do it but don't see this as the government is extremely hard or harsh what i always tell people is to build a business system that you have a little bit of space if something changes you can readjust I was told that Chakta has gotten the uh, a license now to do trading. Uh, um, there's a company, one of the startups that helps people buy stock. The government has created a new category of license for them. And Gokada, after the ban of uh, Okada, I think he's generating $100 million per year now, according to their latest press release. So what I'm saying here is that even banning Okada has turned out to be a blessing for Gokada. Because there is no way they will be making money, that kind of money they are riding on Canada. They have become a logistics company. The point is, let's not start seeing that these policies are going to become limiting factors. What is happening here is that we are still a continent or a nation. We don't use data a lot. So most things we do is based on guesswork. And because our statisticians and our economists do not model the implications of what they do. So that's why you keep having all these policy somersault. Because when they try this, it doesn't work. They try another one, it doesn't work. But that should not discourage you. What you need to do is, when you are starting, try as much as possible to have an elastic playbook that if for any reason there is a little perturbation from one part, you can easily adjust to accommodate it from the other side. But I've not really seen, except the Okada ban, I've not seen where government has really hammered a company that it has to be extinguished. I've not seen it. I know there, there's the issue of uh, uh, telling company not to sell foreign stocks, but they have given license to that. Yeah, maybe they want you to go and pay another 1 million naira registration fee. Hey, if you can find, pay. And if you cannot find, tell your friend who is also in that business, let both of you combine forces, merge together so that you become bigger and stronger and go and uh, meet the government requirements. But it's part of business in Africa. If you don't want that, you need to go and operate in New York where the laws will not change because they have attained a steady state 
Attending a steady state means there is nothing to change. The law itself, they know what works and what doesn't work, they're not changing. But Africa is not in a steady state motion. Sorry, I'm speaking chemistry now, but you understand what I mean by steady state. When you put a little uh, stone uh, on a ground or on the water, it, you know, there will be a little bit of perturbation after a time it settles. That settlement, you can call it a steady state, nothing changes. But the time you put it, there will be things you see that, that changes on that water, water, water. America has done these things we are doing maybe 100 years ago. And that's why you see that our policies are stable. Africa is still at a phase where we are trying to figure out what works. But we are hoping that our policymakers will use more data to drive. It. So you expect it. And the fact these things are happening is an opportunity because if everything is settled, Warren Buffett will be interested in Nigeria. And if Warren Buffett is interested in Nigeria, I tell you, you have no chance. So I'm really not hoping that things will just be perfect before these guys start coming. Otherwise, NWC will not even have an opportunity with his little, little, little small change to have an opportunity myself. Thank you. All right, Prof. Um, while while we, we would extend maybe your Q&A time for five extra minutes so that we can tackle more questions. So we have two people who have asked um, a question as, as a follow-up to what you said about e-commerce in, in Africa. And they're asking, how can we reduce the cost, the transportation cost, the logistics cost that you had mentioned earlier? Yeah, actually, that's a very big question. As I've, I think, uh, to a large extent, a lot of people send me a mail, a lot of people criticize me when I say that Conga should sell itself many years ago. And it turns out that within three weeks, Conga sold itself. Um, when I wrote that piece that Conga should sell itself, there was a press release released by Conga a day before. I read that press release, I just said that Conga, there's just no need of this business to be. And they feel that I'm always against e-commerce because of things I've written in Harvard. No, these are pure academic works. I, I don't have any agenda for anyone. But what needs to happen is what we don't want to discuss. And what we don't want to discuss is to tell the government that Nigeria Postal Service doesn't have to be a profit center. When I say profit center is the mindset that the post office needs to lose money every year so that businesses in Nigeria will, will do well. But the, uh, but the way we see it in the nation is that post office has to be profitable. And if post office has to be profitable, if it's not working, let's shut it down. And that's the reason why we shut things down. I always tell people, did you live in the era where you could get a mail from the postal service? If you did not live in the era where you could get a man in the post office, that means you're actually very, very young. <laughs> Some of us that live in the time when you send a mail and you receive mail in the post office, post office, I mean, we had a better moment in Nigeria. I'm telling you. You know, you stayed at home when I was in the village in secondary technical school of him in Abia State. I do, I used to write a letter to, to, to NASA. I say, hey, I just heard that from my teacher, can you send me a picture of what happened in this in this space? I have those maps. They will, you know what Americans will photocopy some of those images and send to you. When I was in photo, I was I did the same thing with IEC in uh, in London. You had what we do in this. You go to the postal service. They have functional service. So, but at the time, post office was not profitable. We now shut it down. We just destroyed it. But let me give you what happened in America. The US Postal Service <laughs> makes tons of billions of dollars of losses every year. Uh, US Postal Service, let me just check loss, last, loss, uh, loss last year, last year. Sorry, I just wanna be a little bit uh, data driven here. Um, uh, I think uh, it, it typically loses billions of dollars. Now, some group of people say, Let's not, uh, let's, not, let's not be losing that kind of money. But some senators say, if we lose, let's say, uh, 13 billion or $25 billion, and we, by losing that money, we can stimulate an economic activity of, let's say, $1 trillion. The implication here is rural America will connect with the urban America, we connect with uh, suburban America, 
And if the rural America is connected to the urban, the suburban America, we can create a very bigger pie for our companies. Out of that one trillion in economic activity, because the postal service is serving the whole country, we, we will task those companies. At the end of the day, even though post office has lost, let's say 20 billion, we could actually be making up to 100 billion. So that is a good business. So that means that we are actually good at a positive of 80 billion. I don't know if you understand the mathematics I'm running here. So that the postal service is losing money, US has not shut down the postal service because they actually want the postal service to connect rural, urban, and all, so that anyone will just forget about logistics, the logistics. Anywhere anybody buys something, the post office helps you, even though the postal service is doing it, losing money. The opportunity it creates is that it drives their economic activity, opens up the whole market for everyone, and at the end of the day, good things happen. And if good things happen, there will be more taxes for the government. By the time the government looks at more money it's making from running that loss-making post office, he sees that it's actually profitable, losing that money from post office to drive that economic. And now go to China. If you're in US, if you want to buy an iPhone case, just change your Jeep VPN to US, say buy iPhone case from China, go to eBay. You can get an iPhone case of $1.92. Somebody will sell you an iPhone case from China, ship it from China to New York at $1.92. You know what? The Chinese government has essentially discounted subsidized logistics, making it easier for any SME in China to do business with all over the world. In other words, they ship things free. So the government captures the losses through logistics making the SMEs in China very competitive globally. That is the reason if you are shipping a container from China to Lagos, it's cheaper than shipping from the container from Lagos to Sokoto. Because in the Chinese one, the government is open to absorb the cost, but in the Nigerian one, you don't have that. So, but they are very smart people because by reducing that logistics business, because you know what? Commerce is nothing but logistics. Supply chain, is what runs commerce. You can't have a commercial system without supply chain. If you can reduce the friction within supply chain, efficiency in the utilization of other factors of production will advance. So America reduces that friction, China reduces that friction, and that is why their economic system continues to rise. So I say this, gentlemen, that Nigeria needs to get a postal service working. If we do not get a postal service working, we will continue to underperform in manufacturing, we will continue to underperform in even the e-commerce because how are you going to manufacture something if you cannot ship it? That is a big point. All right, Prof, thank you so much for your responses. Thank you so much for your session. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, the, comments in the, the comments in the chat box show that people have really benefited and have had like an insightful time. So thank you so much for taking out the time to share um, tips, to share insights, to share data, to share knowledge with us. We really do appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so, so much. We would share the slides with the participants as soon as we get them. So once again, thank you so much for making out the time. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time for more questions but Prof um, shares a lot of his ideas on his LinkedIn page and also on the Techidia platform. So he has a mini MBA program that you can sign up for. Um, we are careers partners for that mini MBA program. So you can always sign up with us and you can learn more about creating value from that class. So Prof, thank you so, so much for- Okay, stay blessed gentlemen and ladies and you have a great weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Okay, so Austin had asked about the LinkedIn page. So Prof, uh, I'll share the LinkedIn page um, as soon as this session ends. I'll share it along with the email. So um, as most new of us heard, one thing that most of the speakers talked about was team and how the, the impact that your team makes. And you know, we at Artiservice, we are 
a recruitment company that help companies, organizations, startups, scale ups, whatever stage of business where you are, we help you find talent who can help you, whether in, in a full time or a part time capacity. We have a platform that you can go, you can sign up on as a recruiter, as an employer to hire talents that can help you scale your business. For our first speaker talked about the strength of the team and how investors are always looking out for a team that is well balanced, a team that um, has the capacity um, beyond just the idea but also investing in the team. So you can always find talents that are better talents that have the expertise that you're looking out for and the right character on www.artiservice.ng. You can sign up um, as a recruiter. So someone had requested, so I'm typing the website in the chat box. So it's www.artiservice.ng. You can simply register as an employer and you can search. So we've made it easier for people to search for talents, hire them based on the skills that you're looking out for. Our uh, first speaker mentioned uh, hiring or having a team that is made up for people with complementary skills. So you can find such people on our platform. Now for those of us who missed the first session or who didn't get post full session, we're going to be sharing the recording of this podcast. As you know, this, um, this webinar, sorry, was recorded, was fully recorded. So it's a two hour, 30 minutes webinar. So it was fully recorded and we're going to be sharing that on our blog. Um, so just watch out for that. It's www.atservicetribe.com. So if unfortunately you didn't get the full, um, if, if unfortunately you didn't meet up with the full session, maybe due to the rain or any other issues, you would find the full recording on www.atservicetribe.com. We're also going to be sending out feedback forms to you as well as the slides from the speakers. So please do well to check your email within today and um, tomorrow. Just do well to um, check your email address um, that you registered for the event with. We'll be sending out the slides as well as other details, the recordings. And for people who want to partake or sign up in the Techidia Mini MBA that Prof already talked about, you can sign up on skillshop.atservice.ng and we'll send you all the details that you need. So there's a whole lot. So please watch out for an email from us. Um, so I'm just going to try and do a little uh, feedback right now before we send out the feedback form. So if you had a swell time, if you had um, an insightful period, can you just um, comment on what was most impactful for you in the comment session so that we know so that we know what you enjoyed most so that we can get some feedback right now, even before we send the feedback form. So if there was any particular session that you really enjoyed, uh, please do share that in the comment session. And like I said, we have a platform with talents that can help you scale your business. Scaling your business is not just about, like Prof said, it's not just about having the knowledge, it's also about having the expertise you need for the execution. So finding those people that can help you scale, finding those people that understand how you can scale you uh, it's easier when you use as a service so you can sign up on the platform to recruit people you can sign up on the platform to search through the talents and recruit people that you want so someone had made a session the part where the postal service is not functional as a major part okay the revelations are simply awesome thank you um, John Paul O'Kay okay, said he enjoyed everything about the webinar. Thanks for the webinar. Thanks at the service for a great session. So thank you all for attending. Thank you all for staying true. Thank you for everyone who joined from the very beginning and stayed up up to this point. I enjoyed the session, the practicality of the information. So thanks. Like I said before, if you enjoyed the practicality, the examples, the analogies that I shared, he does have um, a mini MBA session. It's a 12 week program is self-paced, you can take it online. You don't need to leave the comfort of your room or your office. You can take the program online and you can visit Skillshop at skillshop.atservice.ng. Uh, my colleague Nelson had already typed that, so I'm just going to share that again. You can sign up for the mini MBA on skillshop.atservice.ng and you'll learn even more. So even on our platform as well, if you are an employer, you can share um, roles, the particular roles that you're looking out for. You can post a job on the platform and the talents that you're looking for can easily reach out to you, can easily become a part of your business. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's all qualified candidates. It's all people that have already been vetted because I know, I think I saw one of the comments from someone at, uh, during the first speaker's session where he said, what should I do if my co-founder is not adding a lot of value? And I'll simply say, just get on at a service and find a better co-founder. So if your co-founder is not adding a lot of value, you can find a co-founder, you can find someone that can help you build the business or the sort of business that you're looking to build. So please visit at a service. There is a whole lot that you can do with the right talents and we have the right talents on our platform. So once again, I want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank everyone for staying. Like I said, we're going to have the recording on our blog, www.atiservicetribe.com. And we're also going to be sending you emails with the slides from both the first speaker, Mr. Owem, who talked about startup funding. And we're also going to be sharing the slides from Prof who talked about scaling your business and other links uh, to Prof's LinkedIn, to OEM's Instagram. Like OEM mentioned, he does share a lot of startup tips on his Instagram page. So you can find him on Instagram as Monsieur OEM. You can find, okay, I, I think I have someone with a raised hand. So please, if you have a question at this point, if you have a question for me, if you have a question for us, you can quickly just type that in the chat box and would um, make sure that we answer that. Unfortunately, I can't see everyone, but then please, if you have a question, please just type that in, in the chat section and I'll do well to respond to that. So you can follow OM on Instagram. He's Monsieur OM on Instagram where he shares a lot of tips. He's also launching a podcast where he's going to be talking about side hustles, the um, bootstrap businesses. So you can always follow him. He has worked with Tony Limeli Foundation. So he has a lot, of, um, a lot of tips that he can share about startup funding. So like I said, once again, do visit www.atservice.ng to find, to find people, to find people um, who can help you scale your business. You can, you can register, you can register as an employer and you can easily search our talent pool and hire them quickly. So what we've done is that we've made it easier for you to hire talents without having to go through the rigors of interviews to, once you get on our platform, you're going to find talents who have already made videos of themselves answering um, the preliminary interview questions that you have asked. So we save you the resource of that preliminary stage of interviews and you can simply vet them and hire people who have the skills that you need. So, um, on a final note, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for um, participating in today's webinar. Please check your emails for, for our feedback form, which we'll be sending in, in, a, in a bit. So thank you once again, and we hope to see you in our next webinar next month. And please do share, please do share the link when you have it. Please do share the recording with your friends who unfortunately missed out on the session. The recording is going to be on www.atservicetribe.com. Thank you so much and uh, goodbye.